Hello, and welcome again to Ethics and Leadership. And today, uh, you find us in the... There's everybody. Say hi, everybody. Hi. Okay. So, uh, we enter into a new period of history today, and in some ways, it's something that our topic figure is reacting to. Yes, indeed. Today, we're going to talk about Karl Marx and his philosophy, which is Marxism. The figures that we've been talking about thus far in modernity as we entered into that liberal period after Hobbes were reacting to inequalities in the society that were tied up with the rule of a, a noble class or a monarchy. But even as modern society emerged from the systems of feudal society and moved beyond it, it turned out that this didn't really solve all the problems that people thought that it would. As a matter of fact, as they got going, there were some more problems that came about. So, for instance, the development of the Industrial Age. And all of a sudden there were issues that were thrown up about child labor and how long people were supposed to work. And the issues of workers' rights and should there be such a thing as the weekend even. And in some ways, for us, while we've seen a little bit of that start to poke through in Wollstonecraft's analysis, it really is in this class, Marx, who's the first person who's going to take that on directly. Now, this doesn't mean that Marx was the first one who saw the problems emerging. As a matter of fact, we have to go a little bit back from Marx to a guy named Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You notice that his name should be Jean Jacques Rousseau, but he's French, and you don't have to pronounce the entire word. So Jean-Jacques Rousseau who was a famous Enlightenment and, at times, anti-Enlightenment figure out of France. Rousseau's first famous work was The Discourse on Inequality. And in it, Rousseau was significantly ahead of his time in picking out some of the trends that were going to lead to serious problems as you moved even into the 20th century. And he provided in his philosophy a wealth of tools that later philosophers would take up and use in their own political thought. Unfortunately, Rousseau is really hard to summarize, and it's not entirely clear that he's consistent all the way through his career. And I would really like to do a lecture on Rousseau, but it would take so long to actually get into it and do it adequately. I'm just mentioning him here. Because some of the ideas that he left behind were extremely useful to Marx. Now, in saying this, I don't mean to say that Rousseau was an early or proto-Marxist, because, as a matter of fact, he's just harder to characterize than that. He was deeply worried about inequality, however, and he left behind some of the key terms with which Marx would analyze the world, including the term bourgeois, which is something that I've been talking about for, well, let's see, since Hobbes now. The idea that there was the emergence of this new picture of humanity as somebody who had their wants and was primarily about calculating out how to achieve their wants. And that this became a particular model, especially as capitalism began to take hold. So we'll talk about that more as we get into Marx. Rousseau also pointed to the development of private property as the development of a kind of problem in the history of humanity. He also had some particular ideas about the state of nature which are influential for Marx. And Marx did, as many later philosophers would, took these parts of Rousseau, the parts that fit into his own thought, and deployed them fairly effectively in developing his picture of the world. So with that said, let's turn to Uncle Marx. Y'all know? Y'all know Marx? This is, of course, like developed older Marx. This is usually how he's pictured. Like early on, you can find some young pictures of him with like no beard. It doesn't, it doesn't do him well, I'm going to be honest. Mm -hmm. And even at the cemetery plot where they've got like him put and there's this big like statue thing, a big bust of him with the big hair. Big hair was definitely Marx's thing. But I'm not mostly interested in his hair. I'm interested in his philosophy. So let's say something more about that. Well, first of all, what's real? This is an important question when we get to Marx, because Marx was a materialist. 
but he wasn't exactly the same kind of materialist that like Hobbes was, where Hobbes tried to reduce the human being to all the different parts of the body and like see how that worked out. Marx was what he liked to call a historical materialist, or early on in his career, he actually called himself a kind of naturalist. So what he was interested in is material relations. Well, what the heck do we mean by material relations? It is not the same as the question of whether you are relationship material. That's really entirely different. What we're talking about when we talk about material relations is we're talking about the material forms of life that people live in. For instance, say a farmer will have a different kind of life than a person who works in a factory. And Marx believes that the lives of these people are shaped by the kind of material lives that they exist in. So the practices that you're involved in shape who you are as a person and in many ways can distort who you are as a person. Here we see the development of some of those ideas that we saw first developing like Wollstonecraft and in Douglas. The ideas that the self can in fact be distorted by society in particular ways that take away its fundamental nature. Marx was especially interested in relations of production and relations of exchange. So how is it that we produce things? How do we cash out the value of those things by exchanging them for other things? What things count as other things? So uh, when money comes to count as my cantaloupe, right? So I can switch off with you for a piece of money instead of for my cantaloupe that I've that I've developed. And, and how do we make those exchanges? Do we in fact go down to the market and make a face-to-face -face exchange? Or do we live in a largely impersonal world where I go to a grocery store and I don't actually have to talk to anybody in order to order the things that I get? Can I just go by that little individual checkout that they have now in order to avoid actually interacting with any other people? According to Marx, all of this stuff shapes people. And it makes them particular kinds of people that go along with the modes of production and exchange in their society. And it shapes the entire culture to go along with those particular modes of production and exchange. So, Marx can talk about the difference between what he calls the base and the superstructure. So the base has to do with our material relations. What system of material relations do we live in? Do we live in a basically agrarian society? Have we developed into a feudalistic society where there's kind of hierarchy where kings and lords hold on to stuff and then it goes on down to the serfs who don't actually own anything but work the land so that they put in the material labor while other people in fact gain from that labor or have we gone on beyond that to like capitalism or have we moved even into late capitalism I mean he has all of these different systems that he says are real and are systems of our material relations with each other all of those systems are real. They are the base of reality. And in some sense, they produce the rest of reality. Everything else in reality is superstructure. They're the things that are thrown up by the material relations of society. And, and by thrown up, I don't mean like, I mean like, like they're created by, but they are, they are secondary in their reality. So, for instance, I'm, I'm going to assume that you are actually a kind of materialist, because most of us are today. Um, so imagine that your, your brain is like material stuff, right? It sits in your cranium, and there are little neurons there that are physical stuff that are made of chemicals and all sorts of stuff. And they exchange, like, fire, they fire, I don't know how it works, I'm not like, actually a biologist. But they, they fire, the neurons fire, and those create, then, thoughts. So, like, if you think about something, if you think about a purple dinosaur, for instance... Right? Uh, well, in that case, is the purple dinosaur that you're thinking of real? No. Um, at least most of us wouldn't think of it as real in any substantial sense. But is the brain that's thinking about the purple dinosaur real? Well, yeah, that's real. That's material. So this is somewhat how Marx envisioned the relationship between base and superstructure. The society comes together in a particular system of modes of production and exchange. And that gives rise to particular human thoughts, particular cultural innovations, art, law, 
finance, education, religion, the approaches to medicine, all of this stuff is in some sense secondary to the particular modes of production and exchange that are the actual base of everything. So what you think, the culture that you participate in, are, they aren't actually simply your thoughts. They're the thoughts of a person who exists in a particular economic system. Your thoughts are the thoughts of someone who exists in the uh, system of capitalism or maybe even late-stage capitalism. Now, in some cases, the way that this works will be fairly clear. So, for instance, Marx is an atheist. He doesn't actually believe that religion reflects anything particular in the world. But he does believe that religions end up arising from particular material relations. So if you live at a feudal time, for instance, you will likely develop a religion that focuses on, like, one god who hierarchically controls the rest of reality. And you'll see that as a parallel of the kind of life that you live, right? This is one form of ideology. That system of ideas that ends up supporting and reinforcing the material systems as they exist. The same thing with philosophy. Philosophers will come up with ideas that fit with their particular material relations. So all of this, all of these things that become so basic to us that we just automatically believe, says Marx, well, they're actually a kind of noble lie. We go back to Plato again. And Plato's idea that in the ideal republic, they might come up with a story that told about the different metals people were made out of so that they were willing to accept their places in society. Now, that's a really direct way of doing it. Now, Marx doesn't imagine that philosophers actually sit down and intentionally try to develop noble lies that justify the material system around them or the culture around them. But he does believe that this is just the outcome of human life. Material relations produce ideologies, produce a whole superstructure that allows people to live in the structure without questioning it too much. Another way to approach what's real for Marx is to say what's real is class struggle. So eventually, relations of production and exchange work out in the society and produce a set of economic classes. Now, exactly what the set of economic classes is will depend upon which kind of economy you live in. So, for instance, we can take, I've got two different models of different societies over there, and t take, a, take a moment, guess, guess which one's which, what's going on in each one of them. So, yeah, did you guess that one of them is, in fact, feudalism? So, feudalism is the system where there are uh, a set of kings, like nobility, and then outside of that, if we go down one, there's, like, members of the religious elite and people who are extremely well-educated, and then underneath them, there's a relation to uh, the people who are members of the military, and then underneath them, there are the people who are, like, local uh, officials, and then beneath them, there are all the workers, right? And inevitably in just about every single one of these systems the entire system is built upon the workers and so you can imagine it crushing down on the workers those people who actually put out the majority of labor for the society where everybody else gains from their labor right so they create goods and everybody else uses them now the other one is capitalism and that's the one we're going to talk about most today so i don't want to like give away the ending to you by saying too much about that that structure there, but it's important that the, the, the laborers still end up the majority and, and on the bottom of society. And it's also significant to note that Marx's picture of class struggle doesn't differ that much from even the original pictures that Plato came up with. So Plato imagined that there would be the guardians, right, and then the auxiliaries, and then the producers down at the bottom of society. And Plato justified this by saying everybody was kind of in their natural position. The difference between him and Marx is actually somewhat the difference between a, a classical thinker and a more liberal thinker. This might strike you as strange, but in many ways, Marx is continuing and developing the liberal tradition, that democratic tradition that we've seen start even with Locke. It's just that he's going to disagree on how you should free people for participation in the society.
So in contrast to Plato, and with most of the rest of the liberal tradition, they looked at Plato's system as fundamentally oppressive because it favors people on the basis of a natural hierarchy that most modern people don't believe in or don't believe that you can entirely buy off on. For Marx, the claim that it was a natural hierarchy to begin with makes sense because that's part of the superstructure that's over the base formation of society. So, of course, philosophers would come up with the idea of natural inequalities because those reflect the material relations in which they lived. So what Marx is doing here is not in contradiction to the liberal tradition before him. It is an extension, and in some ways a radical extension, of that tradition because he's going to recognize forms of oppression that early liberal thinkers might have missed out on. Okay, so that gives us a starting point for thinking along with Marx. The next thing that we're going to have to do is go into his account of the history of material relations. Because, again, Marx is going to seem amazingly within the liberal tradition here, he starts out with an approach to society that's the same kind of thing that came out of Hobbes and Locke. In some ways, he's going to start with a state of nature and then move on through there to the development of society. He's just going to locate things differently. As we realized with Locke, if you want to come to a different conclusion, you have to start with different premises. So while he's going to adopt the basic equation that Hobbes and Locke worked with, he's going to change some of the variables as we go along. So let's go into Marx's state of nature. You remember that for Hobbes, the state of nature was awful. It's like people running around, killing each other, everybody's egoistic. It's like the lion and the... the deer runny thingy, and everybody's just taking whatever they can because everyone has a right to everything, and they're all just selfish and filled with pride, wanting to take each other over. Well, then Locke kind of came along, and he changed that variable in the system, and he said, you know what? Uh, no, in the state of nature, people would in fact be rational, and they would recognize that they have their own individual rights, and other people have their own individual rights, and these would be the rights to life, liberty, and property, And right? That would be okay. I mean, it wouldn't be horrible, but it would have certain kinds of inconveniences, especially by the time we get to be judges over your own case, and then the poor wanting what the rich have, and there's still the right to property. So eventually we just give up on it and kind of create a social contract. Well, Marx takes this one step further in the direction of, hey, the state of nature, actually not so bad. In this, Marx is following Rousseau. So if we think back to Hobbes, you might remember that Hobbes knew a little bit about Native Americans in the United States. And for the most part, he thought that they were like people who were left in his state of nature. And so for the most part, they were brutes, which fits with the general European picture that had been in place since Sepulveda. So all that makes sense. But by the time we get to Rousseau, we, we start to get different kind of cultural pictures that can be developed of Native Americans. And some of those are very romantic pictures. So while our society still has pictures that go in both of these directions, if you can imagine Native Americans as kind of being at one with nature, being in tune with their own natural state in a way that we have lost because we've become parts of cities and because we've become so, so civilized and so urbanized. Well, some of these were the kinds of reports that Rousseau drew on in developing his own picture of the state of nature. So he imagined that in the state of nature, people wouldn't be egoistic at all. We wouldn't be like the lions running after the gazelles or the antelopes and taking them down. Rather, we'd be like a, a kind of herd of antelopes, which, I mean, antelopes, they seem to get along just fine. You, I mean, they, they might argue every once in a while, but it's, it's not serious, and they, they still 
Like, they're not killing each other and eating each other, right? And for the most part, if one antelope goes down to the, to the river or to the lake and they drink out of it, they don't claim that that's then their property and that none of the other antelopes can come by. No, they get along fine. And so Rousseau developed this romantic picture, the picture uh, that's often called the picture of the noble savage that is in touch with their own nature, and so unconcerned about things, and not as pent up with greed and pride as typical members of urbanized society. And this was the picture Rousseau took off. So Marx picks up on this and develops a picture of primitive communism. The idea that people in a state of nature would in fact have developed in social relationships with each other, natural social relationships, where there was no significant greed or pride or any of these passions. They would have been like a, a herd of antelopes, getting along fairly well, not really having that many problems amongst themselves. And this actually seems like a really nice state to be in. However, it's an undeveloped state. We can't go back to the state of primitive communism, because by the time we start moving out of that framework of material relations, we'll have developed to a point that we can't unthink our way back to our natural status. We have to push on through the different stages of material relations in order to get back to a place where we might have something like the existence of primitive communism, but now a developed form. On the far side, we'll be fully realized human beings. At least this is the way Marx saw it with his view of progress. Progress, again, another typical liberal idea. Marx is just a, just a member of the liberal tradition. What are you going to do? Okay, so let's talk about production and human nature. Marx believes that human beings are creatures that are tied up with their own labor in significant ways. And here, again, you can see him drawing on none other than our friend, John Locke, who suggested that our labor was in fact an extension of ourselves, right? That was the basis of Locke's theory of property rights, that because our labor is ourself and then we mix it with something else, that then becomes our own property because we own ourselves and we own our labor, so by extension, etc., etc. Well, Marx wants to go along with them partway there. He does want to say that human beings are expressive beings, would be a term that Marx might use, but expressive beings that we, in fact, identify ourselves and want to be able to be identified with the products of our own labor. And this means that in our natural condition, we produce things and are proud of the things that we produce. Now, I'm going to use a little bit of a kind of faux romanticized image here, too, but uh, if you can imagine a, a kind of Amish community or an Amish worker, right? So I don't know if you've ever come across like Amish furniture or Amish communities before, but um, the tradition is to think about these particular products made by Amish workers as of extremely high quality as opposed to the things that you're like going to pick up at Walmart, for instance. If you pick up your bed at Walmart, do you expect an extremely high-quality product? Well, no, we really don't. Sorry, Walmart, please do not charge me for libel. I think this is just common known. But, okay, so the Amish worker, however, in the Marxist theory, would be more like those original workers as they kind of start to emerge from primitive communism, but are putting their labor into things that they're proud of. And so they try and make quality products because they understand that the products of their labor reflect themselves. And when they make it, they find fulfillment in the thing that they have made. But Marx says this doesn't lead them to the idea of private property. As a matter of fact, when they produce it, they would want to share it with other people. So when I share with you a pair of shoes that I've made, I'm able to go and look and see you wearing those shoes and think, golly, those are really great shoes, aren't they? Those are kind of an extension of me, an expression of my deepest self.
Marx also believes that people are the kind of people who need to be creative in this way. Undertaking our own creative projects is central to human nature. So, in many ways, again, tied to the idea of people who had distinctive wants and distinctive ideas and desires. But these, for Marx, are cashed out in creative acts which can be used in favor of the society. Again here, we can use a romanticized image of Amish society where, I don't know if you've ever uh, experienced, seen, heard of a barn raising, but in Amish society, you might have a barn raising where you call out somebody needs a new barn, and so that day, everybody just shows up on their property, and everybody contributes what they're able in order to bring the barn up, and it happens incredibly quickly. Usually by the end of the day, they're done constructing the barn. And they all look at this as something that they themselves have done. They have put some quality into this. They have made it a better barn than it would have been without them. But this doesn't mean that they now own the barn. No. I mean, they came and they did this in order to share it with a particular member of the community. So, for Marx, this reflects a kind of primitive communism, although by that point it's obviously developed beyond just primitive communism into more of a developed culture. People are already starting to emerge from their primal selves into a more cultured self. Now, Marx has distinguished between the relations of production, which he thinks are necessary for human life and human fulfillment, and the picture of the development of private property. Because he actually sees production as a positive thing tied to human fulfillment. But he sees the development of private property as a big problem. As a matter of fact, in your reading, he called it much like original sin that drops human beings from their place in the Garden of Eden into the pit of sin, to use Augustine's imagery. And actually, it works fairly well, because Adam and Eve, when they were in the garden, right, they were equal. They just had the fruit that they could pull down for themselves. They didn't worry about, like, private property or anything like that. But once you get thrown down to the pit of sin, then you have to have government to restrain you and all sorts of evil that come about. Well, basically, Marx thinks that the occasion for what we might call original sin in religion is, in fact, the creation of private property. Because he says it's the first time that somebody comes by and says, you know what, this chair is my chair. I've made it, and only I can use it. I'm not sharing it with anyone else. That that's the first time that we get developed the emotions of pride and greed. With private property comes the development of greed. People weren't like this before. We weren't like this before we developed the institution of private property. Because before that, there wasn't stuff that could be mine or yours. So human beings were not egoists in the beginning, as Hobbes thought they were. They become egoists. They are taken over by pride only when we have the development of private property. Private property fundamentally distorts our nature. And this form of material relations, where I say I have something and you don't, will start us down the road towards even further corruptions of human nature as we march along in the history of material production. Another factor which will come about, which will cause problems, is the development of the division of labor. Now, eventually, we'll discover that we're more efficient. We can produce more stuff if, as a matter of fact, we specialize in particular things. So if you have your job that you get good at, and I have my job that I get good at, and then do this all the time, well, we'll be able to produce more. And this is really important once we become kind of greedy people, because now it seems like the more we produce, the more we can have. And so this becomes an over overriding value, you remember, back to Bentham. And that picture when utilitarianism was taken over by economists, and they assumed that greater production just equals the welfare of the people in the society. 
Well, Marx says ah, there are actually significant problems with this because human beings, by their nature, wanted to participate in all these different creative activities. So they wanted to, to do these things. And here you can actually see a little bit where Marx might overlap with Aristotle in thinking that humans need to participate or be able to participate in a range of different activities. By breaking us down into particular jobs, you may allow us to produce more, but we'll lose something in the exchange. We'll lose a little bit more of our human nature as we move towards more civilized and bureaucratized society. And it's really at this point that we get the development of a need for government. Because it's when people become unhappy with their lives that we need some structure to force the order of society upon us. And so, in many ways, like Augustine, going back to Augustine's picture where government only arises when you have original sin in place, Marx holds that government only comes about after you have private property and the arising of a kind of bureaucratizing and specializing of society in a way that makes people alienated from their own nature and their own products. And I'll say more about that in a minute. But it's when people are unhappy with their own existence that we need government to force them into the kinds of lives that the modes of production and exchange in which they live demand. So for Marx, government is not a particularly positive thing. Now, we'll have to qualify that a little bit when we get to the end and start talking about what his positive view for communist society might look like. But at least when he uses the term government, usually he means a kind of repressive system. Now, I'm going to fast forward a little bit in the history of material relations because there are actually several different systems of economy that come before we get to capitalism. And so we're going to go... Okay, now we're at the development of capitalism. And capitalism is distinctive because it gives rise to a particular set of hierarchies, a particular set of classes. Now, in the feudal system, we had like kings and nobles. And then eventually towards the end of the feudal system, we got the development, right, under Locke, of this kind of upper middle class person who was this, this calculator of things. And eventually that person took over the economy and they overthrew the monarchies and nobility that had come before them. You can see this with basically like Locke. Now, bourgeoisie, as I've used it, is in fact a name for the distinctive kind of person that emerges with the collapse of feudalism and the creation of modernity and modern economic systems. So that kind of person who is in part driven by their fear, that's always calculating what can we get for the lowest cost. And this becomes so much a part of our minds that, again, we forget that there's any other way to think. As we go, all of the institutions of society Society will eventually fall to this kind of market logic, where in the past there were in fact institutions that were not business institutions, but provided for common goods for the society, going back to like Aristotle and Plato's ways of thinking. So think about like mm, colleges, for instance. Um, colleges were to educate people who would be citizens. You remember back to Aristotle's idea that the true citizen has to be experienced in a whole bunch of different areas. Well, this gave rise to the idea of a liberal arts education. That wasn't liberal in the modern sense of, in fact, defending people's rights. It was liberal in a classic sense. These were the arts of the free person. The person who was able to be a citizen and a leader in the community. So schools functioned in order to serve common goods, in order to make particularly good citizens. And they weren't businesses. But as we get going into modernity, as we enter into a capitalist system, well, all of a sudden, schools become about producing workers. So the question becomes, if I go to this school, will I be able to get a job when I come out? Not what kind of person will it make me if I go to this school, but will this school have an immediate vocational outcome? 
and schools get to be run more and more like businesses so that professors think about their students more as consumers, as customers, than they do about them as people, and on and on. This is just the tendency of bourgeois society, and it happens all over the place, including to the central instruments of government, for instance. So lots of people look to the government and they see, well, What's the cost-benefit analysis of everything that happens in the government? Here we can see how utilitarianism is, in fact, a supremely bourgeois approach to ethics, because it boils everything down to a kind of cost-benefit analysis. Marx would say, of course, this is exactly the kind of thing that you would expect a capitalist society to produce, because the bourgeois are the most important in the society, and so that framework will become the definitive ideology for the system. But the bourgeois are not the only ones in a capitalist society, because societies always form a hierarchical structure that is over the labor force, the actual workers in the society, and ultimately crushes those members of society. So we have not only the bourgeois, but the proletariat. How can you tell the difference between somebody who's bourgeois and someone who's proletariat? Well, the bourgeois are the people who own the means of production. They've risen to the point in society that they own the factory. They're not the people who work in the factory. So the bourgeois are the bosses, the owner layer, really. And then we have several layers in between of like managers and bureaucracy that gets worked out in between them. And then we have the proletariat, the actual workers, the actual laborers. And built into this system of material relations is an automatic abuse of the proletariat. Marx figures this because he embraces what can be called the labor theory of value. He figures that the amount of work put in is the value that the product has at the end of the day. I mean, we could add in the kind of materials that any product is made of, but for the most part, the labor is what produces the value of any product. Well, you note that the laborers, the people who make the product, don't get back the full value of the product when it's sold. Instead, the members of the bourgeoisie, those little calculators who are trying to figure out how to get ahead all the time, they always take a certain amount of the value and keep it for themselves. So the worker is only repaid a certain percentage of the actual value that they put into the product. The members of the bourgeoisie are always collecting that. And here we can actually go back to the picture that I developed when we were talking about Locke. So you remember those people who went by and picked down the apples at the beginning of the story. And then one of them, right, uh, planted some of the seeds, and so those trees came to belong to them. And then eventually we had the development of money, so that over seasons that person could keep building and building their reserves, their money that they could keep across seasons. And then there was a bad season, somebody else lost out. And so the person said, okay, here's the deal, I'll buy your field from you, and then you can continue to work work on it. But you'll, what you'll get is 70 cents on every dollar that I get for the apples that are sold. Well, Marx basically says, yeah, this is exactly how things work out. But unlike Locke, he sees that this is a problem. Because if that happens, what eventually happens is the development of two different classes. One which will exist as an underclass that's perpetually abused in the economic system, and the other one which becomes a class of rulers, the upper middle class or the upper economic class of society, who gets by not on their own labor, but primarily by owning things that make money off of the labor of other people. All right, so that's a lot of marks to, to like take in. I've been jumping fire hose into your mouth. Um, so uh, I'm gonna take a break here. Uh, don't don't get too depressed. Don't get too too involved in your own alienation. To come back, 
and listen to the next lecture, because in the next lecture, Marx is going to solve this for us. We're going to fight back against the system. We're going to take out the man. So that, in a few minutes, we can come back for the next lecture on Marx.